Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Infoversity, coming to you from Syracuse University's School of Information Studies. My name is Zachary Schuster. I'm the Director of Admissions here at the iSchool. I've been in this position about a year and a half, but I've worked at Syracuse for about 12 years total. Uh, by, and, by far and large, the iSchool is the coolest place uh, to be here as both an employee and a student at Syracuse. And today I'm really excited to welcome our guest, Michael Hutchinson. Michael uh, earned his master's degree in information management along with a CAS in data science from the iSchool, and he's currently serving as the Senior Director of Data Science at Arcos. Arcos is a company that specializes in on-course tracking systems for golf. They are recognized as the top choice for tracking golf performance while playing on the course and are endorsed as the official game tracker of the PGA Tour. Arcos is, uh, aims to revolutionize the golfing experience by integrating automatic shot tracking with artificial intelligence and stroke gained analytics. Michael's lifelong passion for golf analytics has turned into a very fulfilling career dedicated to his area of expertise. So welcome, Michael. Ah, thanks so much for having me, Zach. Excited to, uh, to talk with you today. Yeah, and as, I, as uh, we've talked uh, earlier before the call, uh, we're just about to start golf season here in the Syracuse area. Uh, a lot of snow in Syracuse, of course, uh, and in California, where you're calling from today, you can golf all year round, but uh, we're certainly excited about the golf season. And we're also really excited about data science here, of course, at the iSchool and Syracuse University as well. Um, lots of people talk about turning those passions in life into a career. You're a really great example of how that's possible. Can you tell us a little bit about when you realized you had a knack for data science and how you could realize you could pair that uh, knack for data science with your love of golf? Yeah. Um, so it's uh, definitely been a very nonlinear path. My, my undergraduate degree was actually in creative writing. Um, and I didn't start getting into data science until around 2012 um, when uh, actually it was fantasy basketball. Um, that kind of brought me into it. That and uh, I was working in politics as well. So I came to the iSchool. I got my MS in information management, CAS in data science. Um, entered the tech industry after that um, and kind of built skill sets as an IC and um, manager uh, as well. And, and started off working in digital marketing um, and then digital audio streaming at a company called TuneIn. From there, I went to uh, Amazon uh, Games, Prime Gaming, and then Amazon Game Studios. Um, and my motivation in those areas were, was always more, these are interesting problems. Um, but I wasn't a big gamer. Um, you know, the industries were never, I, I guess, really my passion area. It was more, oh, I like to, to solve business problems and things like that. Um, and about that same time as I was, um, you know, kind of beginning of pandemic, along with a lot of other people, I started picking up golf again after about a 20 year hiatus. Um, and Arcos was actually one of the first improvement products that I, I bought as I started to get back into the game and see all the, the you know, the advances um, that, that had come about in the previous 20 years. Um, and my obsession with golf really grew i think will be a common theme here is i i tend to when i get interested in something i i really um really like to dive deep and and take it as far as i can um so i was able to to bring my handicap down from a, a 10 to a scratch um over you know a few years um and started making connections on twitter and you know other places as well just getting into the the conversation around golf and analytics um, and yeah, it just so happened that, you know, part of some of those connections, um, ended up opening a door for me at, at Arcos, um, where I'm able to, to work on, you know, bridge this passion that I have along with the, the professional areas that I'm, I'm most interested in. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just kind of a perfect fit. Uh, you know, there, there's not really a, I guess one size fits all path to, to get, where, um, you know, you're able to kind of bridge that passion other than you, you kind of build skill sets along the way and hope that the right opportunity comes up. But awesome. yeah, I feel like I'm exactly where I should be right now. No, oh, that's great. It's so interesting too, because we often talk about non-traditional tech students at the iSchool coming into yeah. a master's degree, and you're just a really perfect example of that. 
Um, and also, I might definitely take some tips on how to improve my own golf game <laughs> by using technology. Uh, can you explain how the technology works with your product and how it can benefit golfers? Yeah, sure. So Arcos is a um, game tracking or, or shot tracking system um, in general. So you take it with you onto the course. Right now we have sensors that kind of screw into the back of your clubs. Um, you pair those with your phone. Uh, we have, you know, all the, the mapping data for, um, you know, pretty much every course in the world. Um, you go out and it'll uh, identify where you hit each of your, your shots from. Um, and then, you know, golf is kind of in an interesting place where um, I think for a long time it was hindered by lack of, uh, you know, analytics. Uh, the, the traditional stats that you would get for golf didn't really correlate very well with score or ability. And um, a guy named Mark Brody uh, invented strokes gained, um, which is a way of kind of normalizing um, the, you know, how much value uh, is there to, to a golf shot. Um, and, you know, with that, there came this opportunity to really, um, go deep into, um, you know, tracking people's games. And this is, you know, anybody that's on the tour right now is using strokes game. They pay attention to it, um, religiously. And what our product allows people to do is, you know, you can now get similar statistics as, um, anybody that's, uh, you know, at the, the elite top level of the game. Um, and then at the end of the day, we, we end up aggregating all of those statistics. We break it down into, you know, um, easily digestible charts and graphics and, um, show you where, uh, you know, the kind of best bang for your buck is going to be in terms of what to work on. Um, so it was, it was really critical to me, um, in, in my improvement, I pay atten very close attention to it. Um, and, you know, I think it, we see anybody that comes onto the platform, we see a pretty big decrease in their, their index um, as they, uh, you know, start entering rounds and learn how to spend their time more effectively. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I remember when the strokes gained and Bryson DeChambeau a couple of years ago, I think it was in the US Open just off the tee and his length yeah. was just really cool to see kind of in real time. Definitely cool as an amateur golfer to be able to utilize some of that same data and to improve your own game. Uh, we've talked a lot about generative AI over the past couple of years, uh, really since this explosion. Uh, but how has is, how is generative AI impacted your work? And are there things you can do now that maybe weren't possible just a few years ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like anybody in this space, I'm super interested in generative AI. Um, and, you know, if you're not paying attention to it as a company or as a, a professional in the, this field, you're really missing out. Um, when I actually first started consulting for Arcos, one of the first things they had me do was, um, come to the, the company during their, uh, annual onsite and give a presentation on large language models. Um, the goal of that presentation was really twofold. It was, you know, how can we use this internally to improve our processes? Um, you know, whether that's generating marketing ideas or, um, helping with develop code and, you know, things like that, but also how can we think about, um, leveraging the technology for our users? Um, so on the, the day-to-day -day side, I, I'm not ashamed to admit at all that I use chat GPT and, and now Claude quite a bit in, um, helping to, to code. Um, you know, it, it's really a, a pretty integral part of my workflow now. Um, there's just things that you do where it's, it's nice to have a little helper, you know, I'll use Copilot as well, um, to generate a lot of that. Um, but when it comes to, you know, customers, we're obviously exploring how we can take data and, um, more effectively communicate insights, uh, and analysis, or even provide kind of personalized guidance at scale. Um, and so, it, you know, without going into too much detail, very much in the R and D phase, but, um, as we've looked at taking user stats and, and kind of supplementing that with um, knowledge from the, the top um, uh, coaches and, and people in the world, we're, we're seeing a, a really kind of encouraging, um, you know, uh, I guess, mix there as um, we kind of look into, hey, how can we... Um, 
leverage this technology because obviously, um, you know, paying for, for coaching is, is quite expensive. Um, and, you know, is there a way that we can provide kind of more actionable, here's what you should work on um, based on the data that we're getting and the stats and comparison across, you know, all of our, our user base. So like I said, very much in the, the R&D phase, I think there's probably a lot more applications um, that we haven't even begun to dig into. Um, but yeah, uh, over the next five to, you know, even sooner than that, I would say over the next, you know, three to five years, it's going to be uh, really interesting to see how it expands in this this space of kind of coaching and guidance and, um, you know, the, the role of experts in that, I think, is a, an interesting topic as well. Yeah, I think that data is just super, super cool. And it's really critical for your own golf game. I know yeah. that after a round, I often focus on the bad shots that I hit, you know, uh, yeah. forgetting about how I scrambled on a terrible tee shot to make a par somewhere in between. So collecting all of that data and being able to look at it after your round can certainly That'd be super helpful. And hopefully down the road, maybe, maybe the product can, can predict when my wild slice will, will come back into play. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I it mean, happens. Totally. I, I think, uh, you know, that that's certainly something that we've looked into is, you know, you're um, hitting a, you know, about to hit a, your tee shot. And we see that, um, you know, there's out of bounds on the right. Uh, you know, can we adjust that person's aim line or their target um, to help them avoid that? And so I think that there's there's tons of things that we can do there and just kind of getting started now, um, exploring all the possibilities. Oh, very cool. So Michael, kind of piggybacking off of that, like how, how does your company, how does uh, Arcos uh, condense all of that data that you collect really into the best, most actionable insights uh, while you're on the course? Yeah, uh, I... It's a really good question. Um, when I think about that, I, I kind of think about like the DIKW pyramid was one of the first things I, I learned at the iSchool, which was the data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Um, and so at Arcos, you can think of the data as like just the raw events that we collect. Um, we collect a ton of data, as you can imagine, throughout your round. It's not just, you know, a shot was hit here or a shot was hit there, but we see you walking, we see if you're riding in a cart, um, we know what the wind is doing, the temperature, all of those kind of things. And you can imagine the size of that data, um, you know, when, when you're looking at any single round, you know, over the course of four hours, everything that, that we're collecting. Um, but if we just presented that to the user, that's not going to be very helpful, right? Um, and so as it kind of moves up, um, you get into the the state of like information from data. We we start adding structure to um, to that, and we we get to okay. Now here a shot was taken here. Um, you know the had this wind into it, or we we start combining it, um, and then you get into knowledge. And I think knowledge is kind of where um, that's when we start getting to like the dashboarding level or the aggregated insights where we're taking that, that, you know, kind of, um, that kind of loose bag of facts of, you know, here's, here's the sequence of events and what you did. And we're, we're, you know, creating the calculations obviously for strokes gain, but now we're providing a layer on top of that, that says, here's your, your strokes gain from 150 to 175 yards. Um, you know, this was the area that you lost the most strokes in throughout your round. So maybe a place where, for you to, to focus. And then I think that bridging between knowledge and wisdom, and I know that there's a lot of debate, um, within the kind of academic circles that discuss this, but, um, you know, I think that's the, where we get into, um, how do we make that even more actionable for somebody? And how do we present only the bits that are, are relevant to them? And I think that that's one area where generative AI um, is really promising because it can distill those kind of salient facts and, and, and bits of information down into, you know, when paired with kind of a, a expert guidance, um, here's where you should focus the the majority of your time. So it's actually taking, you know, 
that that dashboard, which is already you know taking a lot of information and aggregating it and figuring out what are the two to three things that I should take away with, uh, you know, at the end of um, at the end of that round. Um, and so, yeah, I think like you know, as any company that is a data product, and I do think of Arcos as in many ways a, a data product. Um, figuring out the right amount of information and, and guidance to provide somebody is, you know, is really critical and um, more to come on that for sure. But, uh, you know, it, it's a really good question. And I think anybody that's a, a data professional is, is spending a lot of time thinking about how to, to go from that kind of raw inputs into something that's really holds value for people. Yeah. So I know I've used a lot of different like golf tech over the years, whether mm -hmm. it's an iPhone app of utilize a Garmin watch a lot in my golf play. Um, but I think one of the biggest points is like making sure that with all of this data, you have a really good user experience mm -hmm. so that the product is intuitive and accessible because you don't want people to just see all the data, right. And then just get scared or not utilize the, the product anymore. So can you share any insight how, you guys take this tech and make it kind of digestible for someone while they're playing golf or after their round? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, again, like really good question there. Uh, and it's, it's a, you know, there's many debates between, um, you know, people that are uh, on the product side or on the engineering side about exactly, you know, um, what the trade-offs are. You know, I, I tend to be a more analytical person, so I want a lot of data. I want those dashboards I'm going to go through and, um, you know, have all of that. But a lot of people don't want that. They want information provided in a couple of bullet points. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a, a balance at the company where, you know, we have really good product people and, and smart, you know, leaders at the, the company um, who who think quite a bit about that. And we have, you know, as a, it's by far the company that I've worked at where we've, we dog food our own product, you know, more than any place else that I've been. Um, and in, in doing that, I think we get a lot of, a range of perspectives on what's going to be helpful and, and how to, you know, as I've said, distill that information down into the most salient bits. Um, you know, I think that there's probably a there's a potential for some bifurcation there where we, you know, for the analytical person that wants to see all of this more broken down um, at a really granular level, um, there may be one experience. Um, and for the person that really just wants a high level recap, here's what you did well, here's what you should work on, um, you know, how to provide that. Uh, and whether that's we're communicating that through, a, you know, a visualization that shows, you know, right now we kind of highlight in green the things that you did really well and in red the things that you didn't do quite so well, which is intuitive to, to most people. But, you mm -hmm. know, some people really struggle with charts um, and, you know, do better if they, they get that information verbally. So, again, like another area where generative AI and large language models um, really has the potential to shape what we're looking at as a product and how we're communicating insights to people. Yeah, very cool. So you mentioned uh, as we first started the podcast uh, today that you brought yourself from like a double digit handicap, you know, down to a low single digit handicap. Was there anything that you learned in using some of these products that like surprised you like as you're going through this journey and improving your golf game? Yeah, I think there were definitely parts that that surprised me. Like I said, I, you know, before any of this was even, um, in the, the horizon as something that I might pursue, I, I was an Arcos user. Um, and I think when I was, I played in high school and I was, I was a decent player in high school, but not great by any stretch of the imagination. We just didn't have any of that kind of information. Right. I, so I would still track my, my stats. I tracked my fairways, um, uh, per round, I tracked uh, greens and regulation. I would track putts per round, but the, you know that information didn't really tell you where to focus your your time to improve. And I think one thing that really surprised me was um, how weak I was relatively in approach play um, compared to some of the rest of my game. I thought I was a decent approach 
player. But um, as I looked at the data, I realized like, well, wow, I've really got a lot to uh, to work on there. Um, and so I would take that and I would uh, bring it to the coach that I w- was working with. Um, and we kind of came up with a plan together about, okay, here's why that's, you know, you're, you're underperforming there. Here's what you can work on both from your swing and from a, um, a skill acquisition standpoint. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, now I'm, I don't get quite as many surprises. Like I finish my round and I pretty much know, you know, what I did, where I, where I performed at, or, you know, better than the benchmark and benchmarks that I compare myself to and where I have the most room for improvement. Um, but it's great to have that validation too. Right. Um, because we, we tend to remember, like, I think you referenced this earlier, like, the one or two bad, really bad shots or the one or two great shots. Um, mm-hmm. And we kind of forget everything else that's, that's in the middle. Um, and, you know, if you're, you're not paying attention to, I think this at a kind of a trending level where you're looking at, you know, 10 rounds um, trending uh, view or something like that, uh, you might get drawn into, you know, areas where it really doesn't make sense to, to put a bunch of time, especially if it maybe it's only a situation that you face one out of every five rounds. Um, so I, I think for me, it, it really helps to just kind of validate that I'm on the right track and I'm paying attention to to the right things. But definitely surprises in the beginning, um, and I think it's always just good for me now to be able to go through and be like, oh yeah, that was, um, you know maybe that one really bad shot, I actually performed really well the rest of the day in that area. So it's maybe not something that I need to focus on. So it kind of helps to to take some of the emotion out of it, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting too, like as, as you probably utilize some of that data, you just learn a lot about your golf game and then you can almost probably fix some things on the fly a bit more than, mm-hmm. you know, before you had that data accessible to you. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. Like, um, uh, and this is not a problem just for me, but is for, um, most amateur golfers is coming up short on approach shots. Um, a lot of people just kind of play to the distance of that really great shot that they hit. Um, not thinking about like the, you know, a lot of the mediocre shots, um, that they hit. And so like, you know, I, I tend to, to hit a lot of approach shots short um, and kind of being confronted with that data. It was like, oh, I need to take more club into a lot of these greens. And I'll see that in a, a round. And one of the things we have are smart distances, which are like your distance, but we're also layering in information about altitude changes or, uh, you know, the um, whether you're hitting uphill or downhill and um, into wind or uh, with the wind. And we kind of normalize those distances. So you can look at that and see, yeah, um, you know, maybe I need to take a little bit more club into these greens. Um, So yeah, it really helps uh, provide that kind of information on the fly that allows you to adjust um, your game even during the round. Yeah, all those little bits of information add up really quickly to take a a, a pretty bad round to a pretty decent round. Totally, um, yeah. yeah. And for most people, it's not far off. You know, it's it's a few adjustments here or there, and and most golfers have a lot of low hanging fruit in their game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Arcos just like really helps highlight that and and helps uh, come up with an action plan about how to address it. Yeah, so this is actually a great segue to to my next question for you, uh, Michael. Without giving away, you know, any trade secrets, can you share maybe some previews or things that might be coming out in the world of golf analytics? And and then a follow up question on that: like, what are you most excited about in the future of of the industry? Yeah, um, gosh, there's so many things that are uh, on the horizon that I, I wish I could go into, but do have to be a little bit careful about giving away um trade secrets uh but i i will say i think like you know one of the things that um that is an ongoing type of um i guess struggle or challenge is just the data capture and data quality um how do we make that as seamless as possible and for the widest you know uh 
range of golfers as we can. So, um, you know, right now we, we rely on kind of the, um, the sensor models. Are there ways if, you know, the a sensor gives out that we can identify that a shot was hit from somewhere using different predictive models, things like that. Um, you know, I, I think that's one area where um, we're spending a lot of time and focus is figuring out how we can make that that experience of the data capture as seamless as possible and which then trickles down into the analysis that we do. Um, so, you know, in the, the type of analysis that, that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I, you know, I really helps to have high quality data. Um, and we really don't want the user to have to be going in there and editing shots and things like that. So I, I think that there's a few things that we're developing with the product um, that we'll be releasing within the next year that are, are pretty exciting there. Um, and then I just kind of go off of, you know, once you've, you've captured that data um, and you're, you're happy with the, the accuracy of it. Um, the most exciting area for me personally is thinking about coaching at scale um, and how to take all of these insights that we're, we're gathering and not just say, okay, here's where you should aim on this hole or, you know, course strategy type stuff. Here's the club to hit. Um, but also what are we learning about your game as you go and how does it compare to, to others that are within a similar skill level? Um, what have we seen for the people that, that started where you are and have, uh, you know, really improved? Where did they improve the most? You know, I just did a, a an analysis of golfers who were five handicaps or above and and made it to to scratch. Um, and looking at that, you know, it was pretty clear that in most cases, it's actually the approach game um, where they saw the the greatest improvement. And I think that that kind of runs counter to a lot of the the kind of old wisdom that's out there about you know drive for show, putt for dough, and things like that. It really wasn't putting for those golfers. Um, it was approach game and off the tee. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's ways that I think there, you know, um, that we can provide guidance, um, or coaching at scale, uh, that I think is going to really make it easier for, for people to improve. And I think like, you know, maybe that is not the kind of AI swing model that, you know, some of that is out there right now where, Companies are capturing it and building these kind of 3D models based on the, the 2D video and, and generating swing tips and stuff like that. Maybe that that is what we look at, but maybe it's also um, from more of a, a skill acquisition standpoint and looking at, hey, here's the, you know, the a few drills that you can work on based on what we're seeing in your game and, and your your shot dispersion that we think would help. Um, and so I, you know, I think that, uh, AI is obviously going to, to continue to, to move in ways that we're maybe not predicting, or, you know, is going to, uh, is going to surprise us. But I think the one thing that, that we can be sure of is that it's going to feel more and more personal and it's going to be tuned more to, to who you are, um, and your, uniqueness. And I think that that's definitely, you know, part of the, the, the work that excites me the most is kind of building that future of, um, you know, not how we replace anybody or anything like that, but how we can augment and, and help um, people along with that journey. Because at the end of the day, like that's, that's what Arcus exists for. It's to, to help make people better golfers. Um, and so to, to be partners with them along that, you know, and, and, um, to have them give us their trust and, and help them um, get to that next level is, you know, what I'm really excited about both professionally and as a golfer who's looking to improve myself. Yeah. I mean, it sounds just like a wonderful idea because especially for like someone like myself, you know, we have a limited golf season, right. In mm -hmm. central New York. Uh, I've got two little kids uh, and so practice is limited. So knowing what I should practice on, whether that's approach shots or getting off the tee or something in between can just make a dramatic improvement without needing yeah. to maybe spend as much time golfing. Of course, I'd love to spend more time golfing, but sometimes that can be a challenge. Wouldn't we all? 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so Michael, you, you really got to turn your passion into a job and combine that oh. golf of love of golf and analytics. So, um, has that affected your golf game, like positive or negative, not just in handicap, but like your love of the sport or has that like taken away from your love that you work in the industry? <laughs> yeah. Uh, really good question. I think like this is something I debated for a long time before actually moving into the golf industry. Um, and I talked to a lot of people that, that are in the industry um, before it and got kind of mixed um, results. You know, the thing that I always heard was like from teaching pros who just would play maybe once or twice a year and they were just kind of like fed up with the game. And I think you see that for like, uh, you know, a lot of different professions, like say personal trainers too. I know that that's a um, kind of a common theme that you hear. Uh, and as I kind of went out and talked to to different people, I found like um, some had that experience and where you know, they just kind of got sick of golf and some, you know, ha it had the opposite effect on them. Um, for me, I guess it, you know, somewhat early days, but I'm, I'm more interested in it than, than ever. And I, I love playing more than, than ever. And it's nice. Cause now I have kind of a built-in excuse, you know, um, if I go out to the golf course, I'm, I'm collecting feedback and, um, trying to help myself, but also, you know, understand the product better. So, you know, maybe I'm, maybe it's too early to, to draw that conclusion. Maybe that'll change, but I, I think my passion is, is just grown because there's just so much unexplored there. Um, both, you know, personally and for, I think golf as a whole. So yeah, I, I guess right now I'm feeling very lucky and, and fortunate that these are the, the types of problems that I get to work on. And also, you know, is my, my hobby and, and thing that I love to do. That's great. Yeah. What a good problem to have. So, yeah. you know, like my excuse to golf, I usually play with my father-in-law. I can tell my wife like, well, you know, just doing some, uh, you know, bonding with your dad. It's very important, you know? So hopefully she would have listened to this podcast and catch on to that whole, that whole agreement. <laughs> but, uh, you know, last question, I guess, Michael, and would certainly welcome anything else you'd like to share, but, uh, we're approaching our, one of our first majors of the year mm -hmm. and there's another couple big tournaments coming up. Uh, who do you who do you see winning potentially at Augusta? Do you, oh, do you have any data that you would you would be able to share of why? <laughs> uh, Augusta is so unique, and this will actually be the first year that I, I get to go to the tournament. Um, and so you know, I I really hesitate to put out a guess there. Um, it, it would be tough though to to count someone like Scotty Scheffler out right now. Um, he's just, he's head and shoulders above the, you know, the rest of the field right now when it comes to strokes gained, at least on a consistent week to week basis. Um, everybody, you know, a lot of golfers can have a really hot week, but he's, you know, shown for a couple of years now that, that he's, um, just seems to be kind of operating at another level. And just last week he got a win. Um, uh, having finally figured out, um, it seems, uh, his putting, which was kind of holding him back. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think somebody like that um, with the, the skill set and the, you know, the, um, the kind of mental game that he's got to be able to, to kind of grind out and a major, I think you can't count somebody like that out. Um, I'd love to see somebody like a, a Rory McIlroy or somebody like that, you know, who finally get a win at Augusta, but I'm not sure um, from the standpoint of, of the data that the course sets up uh, well enough for him for me to, you know, put any money on that. But um, yeah, it'll be exciting. I'm excited to go out there and see the course in person for the first time. And uh, get a look at these guys, but maybe that Wednesday when I'm at the, uh, the practice round, I'll have a better, better guess having seen them in action. I'd like to see the the data and analytics on how much money you spend at the Augusta, you know, pro shop, gift shop. Oh my God. We'll yeah, no, that will be, <laughs> uh, it'll be a lot. Um, I don't know. My wife will be with me, so she'll probably rein me in a bit. Um, but, uh, mm -hmm. we have a five month old son, so, 
um, I can always say that I'm, I'm collecting stuff for him for when he grows up. Yeah. You'll have to, of course, get the pimento cheese sandwich and oh yeah, all that great stuff. Yeah. yeah. Already, already planning the day. Right. Well, Michael, um, you know, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I hope to see you on campus in the Syracuse area sometime. Maybe we can get out and I can use you as an excuse to play golf during work. You know, that would always be a great excuse for me. Uh, we'll be collecting data and analytics, of course, on the golf course. Exactly. Together. But it, uh, Totally, been... totally justified. Yeah, no, great for having the conversation. And, and thanks so much for inviting me here. And um, yeah, obviously love the iSchool. Um, it's such a good time um, while I was there. And I think, you know, for me, it just really kind of set up um, my life as it, it's kind of followed from, um, from leaving there. So, uh, would love to get back and yeah, definitely. Uh, when I do, I'll be hitting you up and we'll head out to is it Drumlins. Is that the, yeah, that's the university right. of course. Yep. 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 We'll head out games. there and, uh, yeah, get in some golf. Mm -hmm. Any advice for some aspiring students here at the iSchool or future alumni on how to get there, kind of combine those passions and careers? Like, is it just work hard or is it meet the right people or kind of a combination of everything? I mean, both of those, I would also say um, kind of at a purely practical level, like start doing work in the area that you want to, to explore. Like for me, I think one thing that opened the, the door was like, I had a, you know, um, half dozen kind of analyses or things that I had already done um, within that, that field. And, you know, so I, I came in with a good deal of, of knowledge because I had been studying either my own game or other games and things like that. And I think like, if you get a, a you know, a GitHub repo with, um, you know, some projects that you can point to that, you know, it, it's one thing to say you're passionate about a, an area. It's another to, to demonstrate that. Um, and I think that that tends to, to open up doors a lot more when you're kind of talking to other people that are interested um, in whatever industry or area it is. Um, you know, the more time that you, you spend actually working in the problem space, um, the more that, you know, the, those opportunities seem to, to come. So, yeah, I, you know, I think um, obviously leveraging your connections and um, making sure that you're um, up to date on kind of the latest, uh, in those areas, but definitely carve out some time, um, where you can take on some passion projects and, and really kind of up your skill set so that when that opportunity does come around, you've, you've got a, you know, a foot in the door already and, um, you're ready to go hit the ground running. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Again, thank you on behalf of the entire iSchool community. Like, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, really look forward to catching up with you again soon and seeing what uh, Arcos like comes out with in the next iteration of your product design. Uh, yeah, and just absolutely. The future will take you too. This is really, really great. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, and yeah, uh, all the best to, to you and the iSchool and, um, you know, uh, love to hear everything that, that continues to, to happen and at, um, at the school and the, the, the kind of advancements that you're making, I think are, are just really impressive. So love to stay in touch and, and uh, keep up to date on all of that. And if there's ever anything that I can do to, to help or, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me and same goes to anybody listening to this um, that would like to, to get in touch with me. I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, and um, happy to, to help in any way that I can. Awesome. Again, thanks so much. And uh, we'll catch up again soon.